Inescapably. 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 Inescapably foreign. Welcome to Without Borders. I'm your host, Nolan Yuma. If this is your first time tuning into the show, you know that this, um, if this is your first time tuning into the show, you don't know, uh, but this is the podcast for nomads, expats, immigrants, third culture kids, or anyone else that feels inescapably foreign. Today, I'm here with Paul uh, Darmudi, an online personal trainer, podcaster, and part-time professional writer who's also passionate about travel and languages. In other words, I think we have a lot in common, and I'm looking forward to exploring how culture influences fitness and nutrition. Um, I have a bunch of studies to bring up, but first, I want to know a bit about your travel um, and how it's influenced your work, your experiences. And well, Paul, where are you right now? Thanks, man. So first, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's strange. It's interesting hearing how you're introduced in a podcast. A uh, part-time professional writer is cool. I mean, one part of me thinks that is so cool. And then the other part of me saying, I've met a couple of hundred books over about a year. It's nothing to go too crazy about. But uh, thank you for the kind words I have to say. But yeah. you're six, even though maybe money-wise only a couple hundred bucks, but you're successful. You have a lot of a, a lot of comments and a lot of engagements with your writing, I've noticed. I, I've, I've broken onto Medium and I've managed to qualify for the paid articles from I think you have to get 100 followers it's one of those things yeah. where I think every creator says this I joined the platform form a little bit later than I would have liked in terms of kind of getting the the spoils but no I love it dude I don't do it for the cash I mean I would love to be full-time professional writer at some point in the future but I don't do it for the cash I wouldn't sustain it if I did it for the cash I wouldn't be able to I think you have to have a deeper motivation but to your question currently I'm back in Malaga my travel story is a little bit long-winded. So the long story short is I left home in 2018 uh, to go to Barcelona. I was only originally going for three months and I actually haven't been home to live since. I found, interestingly, a client sent me an article asking me if I would read it around the winter of 2018. And it was about seasonal affective disorder. And I'd never heard about that. But I noticed that every winter I was getting progressively more anxious and sad. And on my last winter in Ireland, some days I would just be lying in my bed and I just couldn't drag myself out of bed. And I've never had any mental health problems. I've never really had any mental health issues of any sort. And I thought, this is getting strange. Like, I'm getting sadder and sadder. And then my client sent me the her article she wrote on seasonal affective disorder. And it was like she had written to me about me. And I went to my girlfriend that day and I said, look, are you up for leaving Ireland? Do you want to go travel? She was a bit apprehensive at first. And so we decided to go away for the summer to Barcelona. So we spent the whole summer of 2018 in Barcelona together. And then she said to me, she goes, you're such a better person here. You should stay. I'm going to go back to Ireland and teach. So I stayed for a couple of extra months, but we decided not to do long distance. And I suggested she move to Barcelona with me full time, but she didn't want to. She felt it was a bit too much of a culture shock which is going to blow your mind because then she came back and said let's move to Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam so I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking Vietnam really that much more familiar than Barcelona but she had a few friends who were private school teachers she had a job lined up so we went from Barcelona to Vietnam spent two years in Vietnam we went back to Malaga for one year when my visa expired in Vietnam then back to Vietnam uh, spent a few months in Vietnam lived in Malaysia for a couple of months and now we're back in Spain Nice. We actually have a, a kind of a similar story there because I, well, I, I didn't really live in Vietnam. I said four months. I don't know if you can consider that that living, but I was in uh, Hanoi. Did you spend time there as well, or just in uh, Ho Chi Minh City? I spent. I took a trip to Hanoi. I okay. lived in Ho Chi Minh for two and a half years, but I can. I kind of always say I lived in Malaysia, but if if, if your thing doesn't count, then mine doesn't count. I think we were a few months in Kuala Lumpur, so I didn't really live there. I just spent a few months in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, I think I think four months is kind of on the borderline, right? Uh, you're still in this phase of a culturalization where everything's really exciting. I don't think you kind of reach the the dips, and you don't really get into all the more the negative sides of immigrating somewhere, right? Um, so, well, what I found really interesting too is that you you were in Barcelona, and now you're near Malaga. What made you choose to go to Malaga instead of go back to Barcelona or pick somewhere else in Spain? Barcelona was an amazing experience, but I just guess I had no desire to go back when I left. I always wanted to live there, and I just 
it felt like that time was o- was over. That chapter of my life was done. I like the climate in Malaga. I like the nature of the people in the south. I think the lifestyle is really nice. It's quite relaxed. It's sunny year round. And um, yeah, I think that honestly, I, d- I don't think there's anything to it other than I just Googled a couple of nice places and I decided to take a few trips around Spain and just, I'm sure you felt this, Nolan, but when you when you land in the place and you instantly feel, yeah, this could be home, this could be home. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I felt that in a way in Spain as well. Um, but I've, I mean, I'm a third culture kid, so I've never really had a place where I say, this is home, right? But um, the longer I live here, the longer I'm starting, the more I'm starting to adapt to the culture and uh, maybe it'll end up being a long-term home, but I really don't know. I think I'm like you as well. I, I like to travel and have new experiences all the time. Um, no, uh, but Bob, uh, yeah. I've heard you say third culture quite a few times. Do you mind? Maybe it's just me and I have not heard that phrase before you. Will you elaborate a little bit on that one? Sure. So I've brought it up on the show before, but just for the listeners that don't know and for you, uh, a third culture kid is someone that was raised in more than two cultures. Forget what age, before a certain age, with it, uh, so during childhood. Um, so they've never really had the time to just adapt to one culture. Right. So they're um, and what what these what they've noticed is that often third culture kids, the pros are that they adapt easily. They're kind of like chameleons. Um, They're able and usually more open minded and things like that. But then the negative side is you don't really have much of a stable identity. You might have some identity issues. Obviously, um, your values might clash with the culture that you're in. And uh, yeah, pretty much all the symptoms, or not symptoms, but characteristics that they they write down for third culture kids, it is spot on, um, at least from for my life. Okay. As, um, yeah. I was just interested. I heard you spoke with our mutual friend Cesar, so I just wanted to actually get a very just to make sure that I'm following along well. Yeah, well, I thought it was interesting with Cesar as well because how he describes his personality almost sounds like a third culture kid, but that was just from growing up in a different or not growing up, but uh, living in a different country as an adult throughout your twenties. And I think there's just not that much research done on that yet, but I think um, growing up somewhere in your twenties definitely has to plays a huge role on your identity. Has it for you uh, living in Spain? Do you feel like your personality has kind of shifted? You said you're a better person in Spain. Um, what about anything else? Have your values kind of changed or you're just happier and more pleasant or? I grew up in Ireland. I left Ireland at 28. So I, I'm as Irish as ham and bacon and cabbage without turning into one physically. Right. And I, I never felt particularly Irish. I have to say, and I think now is ironically after living abroad for five years across say three different countries and so many cities. Now is the most Irish I've felt because something I've learned since I've been away is I really like how the Irish represent abroad. The groups of Irish people that I've met are usually open-minded. We're very progressive and will usually listen to an opinion even when it clashes with something we currently believe. At least that's been my experience. I never really felt that Irish when I lived back at home. I, I felt somewhat disconnected from my own culture and I suppose even something small, but people walking in and complaining, saying, you know, it's a it's a wet old day, it's a rotten old day, it's a dirty old day. And like, I'm from the west of Ireland. It rains about 300 days a year, right? So it's a wet, rotten, dirty old day, 300 days a year. And I, I had this profound realization around 24. Well, I can't live under a gray sky and it raining on top of me all my life. This is not a life for me. And it didn't. I thought it was strange because I, I seemed to be the only person that it bothered. And it really bothered me to the point where it's not just, oh, I don't like the rain. It's like my mood, you just chop 50% of my happiness away under a gray sky. Like even I spent a month at home this year between moving away from Vietnam and moving here to Spain. And all the the things that my brain cues for, like going for a walk, go to do some chin-ups, go to do some push-ups. It, it's almost like it stopped cueing for those. And I had to really flex, say more discipline and willpower to the point where I skipped about four workouts a week when I was back home every every week for about three weeks because my, my shoulders would creak and I felt sore and I felt stiff. And I mean, friends, my Spanish teacher from Colombia, my one of my best mates in Vietnam from England, 
uh, they've both said to me, when you used to talk about the weather, I thought you were such a drama queen, but I'm after going back home in the winter and I get it now. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm a better person more so in the sunshine and sunny weather just because I'm happier. But yeah, in terms of Irish culture, now is the most Irish I've ever felt, but I had to leave home for a prolonged period to get that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. What well, what about the parts of you that are Irish that have made it difficult to adapt in Spain? Or maybe there's just a lot of correlations and it's just been easier to adapt in Spain as an Irishman. What? It's been easy. It's been so easy. I think having a few words of the language has really helped. I think being generally quite curious and open-minded has helped. Um, none of my transitions have been difficult. None of them. I, people, I know people say, you know, the, the first night away from home or the first week I wanted to go home, turn the plane around. I've never had that experience in any of my travels. I have landed in Kuala Lumpur, Ho Chi Minh City, Malaga, Barcelona with this sense of cool like the world is so huge i can't wait for this my first night in ho chi minh i had this feeling of holy crap where am i but it was uh, it was amazing it was exactly what i needed at 29 years of age and ho chi minh was the best two years of my life it turned out it was it went so much better than i expected i remember my girlfriend said to me babe i, I hope you really adapt and i remember thinking i'm oh, fine worry about yourself i'm good i'm gonna have a great time <laughs> oh she just have it was actually leaving Ho Chi Minh and coming back to Spain the the second time. I found that a particularly difficult transition, but that wasn't because I don't love Spain. It was because I wasn't actually ready to leave Ho Chi Minh. It was just visa complications. So, I mean, yeah, I've gone on a bit of a tangent there, but I've never struggled to adapt, Nolan, in any of my travels. I have loved every moment of it. I I feel you, man. I'm I'm the same way. Um, but now just to, just to tie this into one of your articles, uh, the problem with travel no one talks about. Yeah. And um, like I was going through it, and if I were to sum up the article in one line, I think it's a little bit difficult because you, you cover so much. Uh, but the one line, uh, I'll look for it one second. Our mental images of travel are hugely edited constructs of the mind, duping us constantly with the same mechanism that makes us curious if happiness lies elsewhere with another partner, place, or in another scenario. Um can you expand on that a bit? Because I always love talking about the positive aspects and we will talk more about the positive aspects of travel. But I think that's one thing that you highlight that is kind of a problem and something that could be negative um, in, in travel. Do you know, it's kind of a metaphor for life, really. I've, um, I've probably fallen guilty even there talking to you to something I believe, which is the trap of nostalgia, which is taking pieces from the past and heavily editing them with the wrote tinted goggles you know i was happier when because i can't extrapolate my own insecurities from the past and bring them into this moment and that's the same ones that i feel now i think mm -hmm. with travel as it is with romance and love as it is with anything it's easier to envision that there's a better moment anywhere else in some other place just not here and just not now i think it is a common mechanism of the mind that traps us i see it if i can relate it back to my career I see it a little bit with clients who some people might be like dieting for fat loss or dieting for weight loss. And they, they, they envision how happy they'll be as soon as they go out and have that burger and fries that they decided to forego. But then they're eating the burger and the fries and they're no sooner doing that than they want to be back on routine and structure and feeling good. And I think there's a real tendency of the mind to constantly look over the shoulders of here and now and into the future. And I think that's very normal. I don't think you can ever resist that. Um, I think the mind tends to edit things though. It's like, I love the sun more than I love anything in the world. I'll be the first to tell you that sunscreen spills into my eyes. I get sand all over my socks and my girlfriend gets irritated with me because I walk through the tile floor with grains of sand follow following me from the beach. Like it's not some utopian dream, but it's my idea of a relatively happy life. Um, so yeah, and even, even things like you know, there's an idea from Alain de Botton. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he's been a huge influence for me where he talks about how once you have a crush on somebody, you should really enjoy that moment because the only thing separating you from that and then the reality that they're not as perfect as you think is time and getting to know them. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of truth to that one. I don't think there's one person listening to that right now be like, no. I'll you your same. So ultimately, when I talk about travel and the problem with travel, it's the idea that, you know, in your suitcase, 
you put in your shorts and your t-shirts and your sunscreen and your shampoo, but you are bringing your anxieties and your insecurities and your shortcomings and your, your mental well-being. And sitting on a beach in Malaga doesn't make me happier if I'm not a happy person back home. I'm Yes, I get the sun does change my mood. Of course it does. I, I get that. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to illustrate. It's a very consciously created value that I have, which is good weather. But aside from that, I'm not just going to be more confident in myself or I'm not going to just happen to love myself just because I've changed from point A to point B. And I do think you, you risk disappointing yourself when you place happiness elsewhere, just not here and not now, only to get to that destination and realize that your mind has constantly been fooling you into, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy in the future, I'll be happy in this location. Definitely. Now, Paul, everything you just mentioned right now is something I want to get a little bit into later on because your, as you mentioned, right, is kind of a metaphor for life. And the way that you're talking about travel is also the way that you tr talk about fitness, um, nutrition, love, as you're mentioning right now, and just life in general. Uh, but before we get into all that, and also I have some studies I want to ask you about, I'm just curious a little bit more about the travel side of things, because on a previous episode, uh, Why We Travel with Dr. Matthew Niblett and Chris Beret, uh, they wrote a book, Why Travel, and um, they're Britain's foremost independent transport and land use think tank. And they work with various researchers. So you've got like the sociological, uh, physiological, economical, spiritual, and all these different perspectives in this textbook about why travel. Uh, I think you'd enjoy it in a lot of the listeners. But um, one study, and I'm just curious if, if you've experienced it with your writing or any of your other creative pursuits, but researchers found that participants ask to solve a problem they are told originates from a faraway place, give more creative solutions to the problem um, than those participants who believe the problem is local in origin. And I'm just wondering if you've ever utilized this like subcon, like without even knowing it, maybe you were writing about something and at the time you were just thinking about a faraway place and it had, a, had an effect on your creativity. And it's such a good question. And I'm not even sure I fully understand it. So imagine you, you're it, like, uh, you're, you're, you're preparing for one of your articles, right? Which they're often about fitness and nutrition, but they're also about psychology and life in general and love. Um, have you noticed that maybe you're sitting in Ireland or now you're sitting in Spain and before you write the article, you're imagining these situations in a country you haven't been to or maybe a country you've been to once and it's just is far away from the environment you're in right now. Ha have, you, have you noticed it ever plays a role in your writing or, or any of your other creative works? I don't know if this is cheating, but Vietnam, my favorite country in the world, has the lowest rate of obesity in the world. And when clients are starting with me and they have weight management goals, sometimes they will say something that Instantly, I don't know why I go there, but it clashes with a lot of the cultural eating values in Vietnam that I've experienced. So I might be writing an article on something like weight management. And there's a, I like to think there's a philosophical undertone because I don't think philosophy is big words and complicated things and grumpy old men. I think philosophy is quite simply how you live your life. And I think everyone's a philosopher at heart, whether you realize it or not. Just like I think everybody has kind of personal values at heart. It's just, have you taken time to create your own? So sometimes I'll be writing about fat loss and I always come back to the idea that what I've seen in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City specifically is so different to what I see in the in the West, say. You know, people tend to not obsess over every individual food or every individual ingredient in Ho Chi Minh. They tend to eat three or four times a day. It tends to be quite structured and regimented. They seem to have a genuine appreciation and just a, a real happy outlook, say, compared to those of us who take it for granted because let's let's be real if you're not enjoying your food right now you're taking that for granted because if it were taken away from you that's when you would really see the the value in something sometimes you need to lose something or to put yourself in the position of losing it or to see it done another way to appreciate it you know i think acquaintance with struggle is one of the stranger prerequisites for any kind of gratitude and well said. I, and, and and it's not even struggle that i've seen in ho chi minh although i have seen it in parts of asia but yes, to, to your question, and sometimes I struggle to be succinct in my point making, which I am trying to work on, 
I will often go back to my experiences in Vietnam, especially with my Vietnamese friends and the way they eat and live and do fitness and just do life in general. It is markedly different than my more, say, Western or more, more Irish friends, 100%. Same with Spain. Spain have a very rich food culture too. I don't know what their obesity rate is like, but I do know the Mediterranean diet is quite high in the list of recommendations. So I've seen the lowest obesity rate in the world and the Mediterranean diet firsthand for the last five years. And not one, the, the common thing, Nolan, the, the common thing, I have never heard one of my Spanish or Vietnamese friends demonize or single out one specific food on the plate. And if that's, I can't touch that. That's off my plan. Yeah. And I've never heard one of my Vietnamese or my Spanish friends we had a bit of an internet issue there, so I'm not quite sure where this is leaving off. Uh, but Paul was talking a lot about um, the attitude towards food and how that affects obesity more than just what you're eating. And I was going to bring this up later on the show, but since you're already talking about it, um, are you familiar with the French paradox? Have you heard this term before? I, without having heard it, I would have a theory that I know where it can go. I'm assuming do with the French. No, I'll, I'll go over it. I'll go over it. Um, but you'll you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you you actually already talked about it a couple seconds ago. Um, but it's despite the greater prevalence of fat in much of the French cuisine, the French have a longer lifespan, are thinner, and have lower heart disease rates than Americans, right? And the researchers started looking into this, and uh, two researchers, Renaud and De Lorgiel, from 1992 was the study, and they thought it, they said it was because of the wine, because the wine uh, inhibits um, uh, platelet reactivity, um, and that could reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, but. That, that theory is a little bit iffy. I mean, especially since 1992, we've done a lot more research into alcohol. And I think especially our generation, we know just how bad alcohol can be. Uh, but then some other researchers started looking at it and it was more about the portion size. And that's um, seven, that the portions in America are 70 to 80% bigger. But then they also looked at, and I think this is the main one and, and you've already uh, hinted towards it, is that the French view cooking as a leisure activity and they don't, as you said, um, when you're talking about Mediterranean cultures, demonize the food, right? And I think, I think that's has, the, I think that's the most important thing for people to think about is just love what you're eating. And um, I forget which article it is of yours, but you lay out all these questions you should be asking yourself while you're eating or just like some of the descriptors I was fortunate enough just to be raised that way. Like my parents, while we're eating, we would always be talking about the smells, the tastes, the memories it's bringing up and everything like that. And talk about alcohol being bad. Sometimes we do that with a good scotch, right? You smell the scotch. You think about the notes, how it makes you feel. And that also ties into the French with their wine and everything. Um, so... Yeah. Do you want to expand a little bit more about that and how you help clients who might not have this mindset? Like I'm lucky enough just to be, just to be raised with it, but how do you help your clients who, who need to adapt this type of mindset? Two things stood out for me there about you is the joy, the actual joy on your face when you spoke about your own diet is very, um, it was lovely to see, I have to say. As someone who speaks to a lot of people has have maybe lost the joy in food, it's lovely to see when someone genuinely has that. And your your self-awareness in terms of recognizing the role of your upbringing is key as well because I, I think that tends to get downplayed a lot. I'm sure you're very aware as someone with your typical introspection that our behavior as adults sits on the shoulders of how we were raised as kids. And I, I see people who have had the joy ripped away from food uh, from a, a young age Look, I suppose the biggest thing that I try and do as a trainer and as any kind of guide or mentor that I might be to anybody is to distinguish between really healthy nutrition guidelines, really harmful food rules, and then maybe personal abilities or personal skills. So, for example, I think it's a terrible thing to have a food rule. You're not a machine. So the, I can't tell you not to eat food X, not to eat after Y o'clock, or to eat precisely this quantity of such a thing. 
I think it's quite kind of like telling you to use the toilet at this hour and only get sexually turned on by this activity. I don't think it helps. I think guidelines are fantastic because they create routine. If you're going to enjoy a flexible dietary pattern, you have to have boundaries. You can't be flexible unless you have something in order to adhere to. If you're just eating quote unquote junk foods, and I don't love the term, but roll with me here. If you're eating low, low nutrient foods all day, that's not really flexible because you're not adhering to anything. To be flexible, you need to have the skill to say no and the skill to say yes appropriately. And with guidelines, you might say, you know, create a routine, eat every so many hours, um, really figure this out for yourself. And then skills are more personal aspects. Do I really need this mindless snack right now? If I'm going to have a delicious scotch, do I really need the third? Is the third getting into hangover territory? Could I stop at two? Could I have the joy in two? Could I leave it at two? Could I be happy that I'm saying no at two? And it's like you're just touching base with yourself. Skills, like I said, right? There's being taught about safe sex, but then there's knowing what and when turns you on and who and with what and what are the boundaries of that relationship. To some people, monogamy is the norm and to others, like to some people, a third party would be the ultimate betrayal and to others, it's a casual evening when they open up. And I'm saying that as somebody who is in a very healthy, committed, monogamous relationship, I would not like anybody else's ideals inflicted onto me. So I have no interest in inflicting my ideals onto someone else. I think values are vital. And and that I think it's values that ties it back together. Nolan comes to me today and says, Paul, I'm going to have a slice of cake and a scotch. And I'll say, why? And you'll say, I couldn't be bothered cooking. And I'm not so sure I'll, I'll tell you it's the best option. But if you say it's my birthday today and I want cake and scotch, I'm like, knock yourself out. That, sound, that sounds amazing. And values is knowing that you will probably have goals that kind of conflict with each other. Like I love being healthy and I love getting stronger chin-ups and I love beer. They immediately conflict with each other unless I dig deeper and think, okay, well, I'm going to need to negotiate here. I can have 20 beers a night and get better at chin-ups, but I could have three a night twice a week. Like, I think you always have yeah. to with yourself in a wise way, but nobody can do that for me. And when I'm trying to bring clients to a better understanding of themselves, ultimately, I'm trying to remind them you're going to come face to face with a really ugly part of the process that has to make you be a philosophically different person. You're going to be tempted to quiz and go straight back to the old pattern. That's the moment I need you to tap into that value system, that wisdom that you're trying to cultivate. I can't tell you what to do in that situation. And I, I would argue you find yourself in that situation because you've constantly outsourced the what should I eat? When should I do it to somebody else? And I think it's a subliminal out of doing the 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 value work needed to create a good relationship to food. And yeah. I mean, no, I could talk about this all day long and barely scratch the surface, but that covers a little bit of the flavor of what I think as a, as a trainer say. Perfect. And yeah, as you said, you, you can only scratch the surface right now. And it's something that is an ongoing battle. And I think that's the mistake. Well, I used to work as a personal trainer as well. Um, and like you, I'm just very into fitness and nutrition, but I've never been someone that's followed all the fads and the trends. I always like to look at the rules and look at all the new things that are coming out just to kind of like learn from it and pick and choose. Um, but I think a lot of personal trainers, they make the mistake because it's easier to just give the rules, right? Like this is what you're supposed to do. Try this, try this trend. It's so much harder as a personal trainer to do what you're doing. And that's actually like changing the mindset, but it's also going to have such a better result on the, on the people and such more lo long-term results. But as you say, it takes, takes a lot more work as well. Uh, well, Nolan, the, the, why, why are you beaming with joy when you talk about food? Why, why are you not sitting anxiously now worried about those things you can't have? It's because you clearly don't have a dichotomy that you can't have the thing. The thing isn't on your mind because you're not thinking about the thing. So as soon as I tell you you can't have the thing, it becomes a thing. And if I say thing, yeah. I'm not my blood valve. I, I, so I've never had it with food. I've always had a really healthy relationship with food, fitness. Um, I'm addicted. Like I can't go three days without uh, working out. If I'm not a little bit sore, I just feel awful. Uh, <laughs> that's more of an addiction there. But alcohol, that's one where I've noticed that kind of mindset. And I know that with alcohol, genes can play a role as well. But for me, um, when I lived in Canada, and uh, one of my partners was someone who didn't like when I got wasted. 
And the more like mentioned, like don't drink more than three beers, don't do more than this, be careful with this, you act like this, the more I would try to drink less, but then when the opportunity would come, I would just lose control. Like after four drinks, it's like, okay, uh, <laughs> let, let's just keep this going. And it's always been something like I've kind of had to to keep an eye on. Luckily with my fitness addiction, I, I couldn't get hung over very often. So it would only be like, you know, maybe twice a month or something like that. But I've noticed that I've got rid of this in Spain. And I don't know if it's like what you talked about earlier with the sun, or if it's just a culture here, people don't get wasted like they do in Ireland or in Canada or in England, right? People drink at 9 a.m. here sometimes, <laughs> um, but they're not getting wasted. And it's, it's again, with that mindset. And I think I've adapted to that now because now, even if I have three beers, I'm not all of a sudden like, oh, I want to drink more. I'm like, I, I feel way more in tune with my body. And that wasn't like a conscious thing. It was really, I think, just for moving here. I, it's so funny. Me and my girlfriend talk about the same thing the whole time. We could go out with friends here, and we often do. And you might have four or five canyas of those little beers throughout a six hour evening, say three hours for dinner and a couple of drinks after. And it would be the equivalent of having, say, two pints back home. But I'd have two pints in the first half an hour back home. Just the culture, it's just how we drink. It's just the norm. So, yeah, I, I have found my relationship with alcohol has changed drastically. Like, I drank heavy when I was younger. I quit entirely in my mid-20s when I became a trainer and I wanted to build up a business. But since I've moved to Spain, I have a very good relationship with alcohol. I, it's another thing, I suppose, that I don't resonate with with the Irish culture. I find a lot of people are kind of on the beer or off the beer. You know, where I'm off yeah. now. Well, it's a little bit freaky how much we have in common because it was the same routine with me, like, early 20s, like... Had a couple party years and then mid twenties actually took like an entire year off of drinking uh, and then now have more of like a healthy relationship with it here in Spain. It's crazy. I, I think we have, we have a very similar trajectory. I think when you leave your home, when you see other cultures, when you see other people, it does expand. It's the most cliche thing in the world. It, it expands you in just ways that you didn't think were possible. You can't know what lessons you're going to take on the journey. Um, if you'd have told me that this would be my relationship to alcohol and to food and to my body, even say five, six years ago, I would have never believed you, but there's something in the water down here in Andalusia. It, it just gives me a better relationship to all the things that I enjoy. And, you know, I wish it for everybody to find the place or to find the environment that makes you a more enriched person of yourself, because I know not everybody's fortunate to get that. I am lucky. I have good friends. I have good people and I live in a nice place and once you kind of find that, that's a real sense of enough. So, and, and then the nature of my work as well. I, I see what what bad relationships to food and to alcohol and to certain things. I see what they do to life. And you can only see that so many times before you, it, you question your own relationship to certain things too. You know that kind of way? Yeah, definitely. Here, now, Paul, since we're talking about, we talk a little bit about our personal connections and you talk a little bit about your clients. Um, and we're talking about how culture influences the, the nutrition and our own health. Something that's a little bit more serious than, than our issues here is when we're looking at like eating disorders. And even that is culturally bound. So I just want to read a couple things here and just get your thoughts on it. Uh, like bu uh, bulimia is a culture bound syndrome because it's mostly just in the modern cultures uh, with Western influence. And like, if we look at the historic literature, there's little evidence of it existing, but then anorexia is a lot more complicated. Um, like they did one study in 1992 and they found no evidence of anorexia among Pakistani schoolgirls. Um, they also found fewer instances of anorexia in China compared to the West. Um, so it seems like anorexia is less culture bound than bulimia. What 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 do you think? What, what what are some of the reasons this might be? Or have you noticed it with clients at all? Or have you had to use any of your knowledge to kind of adapt to this? My big I have a a theory that I believe founded on good evidence. I would I would even like to look into it further before I really speak on the air. But I'm happy to on the basis that. I'm confident what I'm about to say isn't incorrect. And if somebody does have 
knowledge who listens and can you can let me know but I, I have worked say on a binge eating course with Dr. Jay Glenarden so this isn't me just pulling a theory randomly on the air it's I have a strong suspicion that these kind of mechanisms individualities aside are linked to the rigid diets that one takes up when they believe that the ideal body image is on the other side so if you believe if you just follow this exact diet pattern with no regard for the toll it takes on your mental mental and emotional health because you are going to look like the advertisement that it promised you that you would look like very possibly and likely from someone who advertised that that was taking some kind of medicinal fat burner or anabolic steroid you are not going to get that result you're going to question why you're going to put the blame solely on yourself you're going to attribute a lack of willpower and discipline to yourself and then you're going to try and diet yourself up further out of the hole that you have dieted yourself into now i hesitate to say things i think e eating disorders real ones that debilitate lives the pathology there is so say nuanced that i feel that that kind of top exact topic should be left to the experts and I believe that they start somewhere. And I believe as trainers and coaches, we are in, in some ways body image coaches. Not not in a sense that I need to be coaching someone to a better body image. I don't have that ability. But it's my job to look out for the signs. And if somebody's exhibiting those kind of severe issues, these binge restrict tendencies, they are the onset of severe eating disorders. And I think like roots, they grow and they grow and they grow. And you mentioned, I think, that they there's no historical evidence long term for for uh, bulimia. They haven't found much historic literature. Anorexia, yes, um, actually, among Cath um, a sect of Catholics, there were uh, Catholic saints, and um, then later that because I think I have to go double check. I think the 12th century. Don't quote me on that. Um, and then later in the 17th, 18th century, teenage girls started modeling themselves after those uh those saints um i gotta look into the specifics there again but uh that that's that's anorexia but bulimia they couldn't find anything any evidence of that outside of the west the modern west you'd have to suspect that it is the ideals that have been portrayed i know for sure that i've had my own problems with uh certainly bulimia and binge eating in the past that's why i'm so passionate about what i do now and that's why i'm so obsessed professionally with helping people get a really good relationship with food. You know, I've been asked so many times, was my upbringing a part of why I developed severe body image hangups? And I don't believe it was. I don't, I didn't have an upbringing. Um, I would, I'd be hesitate to say it was any difficult, any more difficult than anybody else's. I genuinely believe it was picking up fitness magazines at 15 years old and seeing a really jacked guy who was on steroids telling me that eat, eat big to get big and then you do that for three weeks and then the next month is a really shredded dude and it's, you know, zero carb for the, for this amount of fat loss and you try that. And all of a sudden you don't really know what you're doing but you're tired and you're hungry and you're starving and you can't flex your critical thinking muscle. You've taken no time to create your personal values and then you just find yourself exhausted or you eat something that makes you feel guilty and you just think, maybe I'm... I wasn't supposed to eat that. Maybe if I get sick, it will help. And then all of a sudden that becomes a mechanism every single time you eat something that's quote unquote not on the diet that you make yourself sick to justify eating it. And it becomes a really problematic behavior or at least that's what happened to me. And I spent years on and off in that cycle and not many people would have known that. And I'm sure because of my personality and the way I present to my friends, they would have definitely not noticed it too. But it, you, can, you can play face around people. You can always pretend to be someone you're not or, or even not exactly pretending to be someone I'm not, but you can pretend that part of you you're struggling with doesn't exist and then you go home and you suffer alone. So I, I, I do suspect big time that these images are a massive part of it. But then I think I heard you and Cesar talk about kind of, um, I know you mentioned woke culture on your podcast and I'm not opening a can of worms here, but I think the pendulum has swung a little bit too far in the other direction where it's... <laughs> I am opening that can of worms because I was actually just going to ask you about <laughs> about that. Um, here, say what you're going to say that I, I do have some questions related to, to that. I, no, you ask what you're going to ask because I have a feeling we're about to clean up. Okay. Trip. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think the pendulum <laughs> swung a little bit too far as well. Um, with any, before I get into one, one quote, I wanted, yeah. No, no, with any movement and with any ism, 
there's always going to be a subset of very loud voices that take the best aspects of any given movement and turn it toxic. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, I'm going to read a few things. Um, one comes from, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, ha Anne Helen Peterson. She's a writer from Culture Study on Substack. And there was one line from an article, I, or a couple lines. I, I thought it was pretty clever, and then I comment on it, commented on it. But here, uh, the evils of drinking your calories became a constant drumbeat of diet culture around the time because we were told that juice-flavored milk and non-diet soda were just ways to pile on empty sugary calories that offered no redeeming value. And we can already see the classist racist weirdness emerging because this was also the heyday of smoothie culture, juicing, and master cleanses to say nothing of the legacy of slim fast, slim, slim, slim fast. So don't drink your calories unless you're only drinking your calories. Cool. And <laughs> I thought that was a pretty interesting segment of it, but what, it, what she was really talking about there was breaking free from diet culture and then using fat as a neutral descriptor, right? And this is where I think it ties into, <laughs> let's say, woke culture and uh, kind of swinging it too far. Um, I think using fat as a neutral descriptor is excellent, but it's been so natural in many cultures. And I think, uh, especially when I talk to some older generations here in Spain or in South America, like, hola gordo, <laughs> ¿Qué, ¿qué tal? Right? It's, it was always just like n more normal. If I teach my Chinese students, um, a lot of time it's like they talk about their body size the way they talk about about hair, right? Like, oh, uh, my mom's fat, uh, my dad's skinny, <laughs> I'm blonde, right? And it's it doesn't have this sense of shame, doesn't have a sense of guilt, doesn't have any of that around it. And I, I think that is something that we should be trying to promote when we're being more open to like having you know, like fat models and things like that. I think it's great to show like, okay, you can have a healthy, bigger body. Excellent. But that's not what the magazines are doing at this point anymore, right? They're showing people that are truly obese on like an unhealthy level. And I think they're doing it to counter all the other side of it. But I don't, it always has to be these extremes, like all these super jack steroids people, steroided people, then anorexic models, and then now very obese models, which are also not um, like showing a healthy body image. And I'm not like, I'm sure a lot of people right now listening to the show, they're probably thinking you're fat shaming, you're fat shaming. I'm like, really? Like that's the rhetoric around it now, just because I'm saying we shouldn't have models that are that huge as an image of health because it's not. And yeah, I'm going a little bit on a tangent here, but I just want to finish up before we get your side into it. Um, I mean, if we look at the predisposition of a bigger body, that exists for sure. But if we look at culture and we can see the amount of like just extreme obesity that exists in the United States and doesn't exist in other cultures, you can't say it's a like a genetic thing anymore. It really is like a health, it's a choice that you're making in those cases, right? Now there might be mental issues and everything around that. Um, but I think that's where it goes a little bit too far. Like we shouldn't be saying that it's good to be incredibly huge and Another thing that ties into this is I've heard this line before, one from a really close friend, and I didn't know how to react because I don't want to fat shame, and I, I, didn't, I didn't really know the correct wording, and, and maybe you do, um, but he, he, and he's a wonderful guy, but he mentioned to me, um, the doctors are telling me that I need to lose weight, um, like because it's on a dangerous level, right? And the, do the doctors are telling me that I need to lose weight. I'm tired of this fat shaming. And I thought to myself, is, is that really fat shaming? Like, are we really at that point now where a doctor can't tell you to try and lose weight? But yeah, that's kind of my, my tangent and my rant there. What, what do you think? And feel free to disagree, right? It's, it's something that I'm just exploring. No, I think it's great. I think you need to be able to explore your thoughts. 
Um, so if I'm to be perfectly honest, I tend to stay completely away. Maybe I don't even tend to. I'm just not interested in the pendulum of extremes that the industry swings into. I've seen that kind of debate of like super drugged up steroided people versus then on the other extreme. But I think that's just typical of human nature. I think the pendulum swings from extreme to extreme in any given domain. I just think weight is very emotive and I understand why. I actually take a slightly different stance, which is ironic because it's kind of the same stance that a lot of the body positive movement would take. When a client wants to lose body weight from from my point of view, I ask them, can they separate, say, I'll use you as an example, just if you had a 20 pound weight loss goal, we need to separate Noel and the person, Noel and the character from body fat, the substrate, body fat, the tissue. We need to view it like a mathematical equation. If we want to break down 20 pounds of body fat over a period of so many weeks, we'd like to essentially break down 70,000 stored calories. If you can take the emotion out of it and see it as a substrate and a mathematical equation to break down, you can become a much calmer, clearer, strategic observer of your own thoughts. And you can finally become aware of that wonderful sprinkle of human psychology we all place over our own goals, right? And honestly, I don't think about it any deeper than that. Uh, I think the body positivity movement, like when I started my Instagram page in 2015, I really genuinely thought I was about to start some kind of body positivity movement. I really did. I had just come out of kind of men's physique bodybuilding and it wasn't a life for me. And then I kind of went on Instagram and I saw, whoa, hang on. These guys are saying that all dieting is bad and, you know, the accumulation of fat tissue is harmless. And that's not true either. So if we're going to have the conversation, it needs to be centered around truth. And unfortunately, extremists don't love truth. They... And that sign of a traumatized worldview is a very black and white worldview in, in in a sense. And it's just the same absence of critical thinking on the other side of the spectrum to be completely bound by diet culture and then to be completely anti-diet. Values come into it. Values are the main thing. So you, I don't currently wish to diet, but that doesn't mean I think dieting is bad. Um, so that's kind of the initial point that I wanted to make. I can't, I can't even, I've lost my train of thought for the second. You had two points there. One was the body positivity movement and the second one was. The body positivity, um, I brought up a lot there. And then I was also wondering about your thoughts, how to approach a friend or a client oh, that yeah. says something like, says something like, oh, the doctors are fat shaming me, right? And it's like, you're, you, you're worried about them because you, you want the best for their health. How, how would you approach that? I think it's probably difficult for a lot of people who have spent a lot of their life feeling or being judged for a characteristic that they don't wish to be judged for. Um, I think there's always an element of whatever element of personal responsibility comes into any kind of decision making. I think tact is the biggest thing to involve in helping anybody change. And I actually don't believe in unsolicited advice. I think some doctors lack tact, so they'll say things in a very unskillful way, in a way that basically reenacts mm. the same stigma that somebody's always been met with. But I suppose I say this as a trainer who has, I've, I've, I have had a fully booked up client roster, say, since 2020 online. Before that, I was in person. So since 2018, I have not, not had a full client roster. Many of those would struggle. I call it this way, and I'm not trying to be overly PC, but they struggle with adiposity. Because I do separate the person from the tissue because I think it makes people more clearer. And mm. I think in the first world, a lot of our eating habits, it would be easy to dismiss as first world issues. But I think they're also a symptom of emotional malnutrition. And a lot of the lives that we've been, I guess, coaxed into. And then we realized that this wasn't the life we actually wanted. And then food is probably the only comfort and joy. Maybe there's a lot of rigid thinking that comes with it and then there's obviously a lot of people that do try diets that don't actually make them a philosophically better person ultimately if you want to lead someone to change not making them feel like a bag of garbage is probably the first step i would also say if you're not a doctor why why does it bother you so much i would also say that even if it does bother you because you're concerned with someone's habits I still think there are better ways to bring someone's attention to certain things that they're doing without shaming them on the outcome that it's bringing about. Like, hey, I've noticed you're less active or hey, I've, I've noticed that you're not going for your walks anymore or you, you don't seem yourself. Not even something, to, you don't seem yourself lately. Is everything okay? But I'll always kind of go back to it. You need to make people feel safe to express themselves or I don't think they will do it. I don't think anyone ever wants advice. 
Pe people don't change when they're told they need to change. People change when they undertake voluntarily a strategy that they deep down suspected they know they need to take and then they might find assistance from somebody who they feel they trust. I have a lady who I'm currently working with. In her message to me, she said the words, and she's okay with me sharing this. She's actually told me this. I'm eating myself to death. And when she told me on the call her eating habits, I said, why are you sharing this with me? A lot of people are not quite as forthright as you because there's an element of shyness. And she just said, I just don't get the impression you're judging me. I get the impression you're solely here to help which is a very kind and gratifying thing to hear. And it's not that I don't get, it's not that like as a human, I'm not compelled to judge. Of course, I feel compelled to judge things. That's, that's a mechanism in my brain. But then immediately within milliseconds, I can catch myself and think if I went to someone, let's say a therapist or someone, and I said, look, this is an issue that I'm having. And they said, really? Get over that. That it's laziness or is it? I'd be, I, I don't know how thrilled I'd be about that. And, um, I, I don't think it's my job to be anyone's therapist or psychologist. I, I, I'm not saying that at all. But I consider the dynamic of a client and trainer to have the same respect that a therapist and a client would have so that they can tell me anything. And I can either say, I can help you here without my judgment, muddying the water, or I can refer you out to somebody else because this is actually much more of a mental health issue than it is a perspective a trainer can help with issue. So I, I think if more trainers and more people take that stance in society, we'll have a lot more people who are feel emotionally safe to be vulnerable because I think vulnerability is true courage and true strength. And yeah, that's just, that's what I found as a trainer. Definitely. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And well, I think a lot of people listening to you right now are probably thinking like, shit, I want Paul as a trainer. <laughs> um, so just, just on the show, can you just give a, l uh, a little bit of, um, an idea of how the sessions work online, because I think some people who haven't had training online might think like, how does that work? How can a, how can someone help me with my movements when they're from such a, a distance? I get that question all the time. So the first thing is I actually do still, uh, only if you're in Spain, one-on-one -on -one personal training, like your classic do some bicep curls. I still do that. I have two clients here in Malaga, but, um, overall it's, it's, it's pretty, it's always, I'm all, pardon let me not stumble over my own words. I'm always refining the service. So right now, essentially what I do is I ask people what they're struggling with and where they're trying to go. And we have a an initial detailed call. And then generally speaking, we set some guidelines and the guidelines are to sustain them. And then we do a check-in call once a week, every week or as many weeks as they need. That's kind of my new service. It, it's always being refined. You used to email check-in, then for a while it was WhatsApp voice note. And now it's kind of uh, video chats for those who require it depending on when clients signed up but a lot of my business goals my personal training goals are centered around creating autonomy in the client i don't want an eight-week transformation i don't want mini balls running around eating watermelon for breakfast that's not my goal i want people to feel autonomous to make their own decisions i had a lady in australia a few years ago she told me that she'd been trying to lose 70 pounds for years and it was that classic case of whilst the goal and the food preoccupation had been on her mind, like she hadn't actually been engaged with the goal. She would give up on a Tuesday and start the diet again next Monday. But but she got all the food preoccupation. So if I came along and say shamed her and thought, oh, you're not trying. A, I, I don't believe that. I, I, I really don't because I know what it's like to be in a black and white thought process. But unfortunately, the truth is, B, you're, you're not dieting for fat loss. You're actually doing the opposite. By giving up, you're consuming far more calories than your body needs because you think you have failed. But I remember she, she lost about 20, 30 pounds and she came back after a couple of months and she said, I hope you're not disappointed in me, but I don't want to lose 70 pounds. I spent my entire adult life thinking I wanted to lose 70. And if I've learned one thing from you, it's I'm actually good now. If I can maintain my lifestyle whilst maintaining this current weight, that's a success for me. And I hope you're not disappointed. And I, I remember having this succinctly strong feeling of this is amazing this is amazing that you can actually tap into that wisdom and realize that the goal has changed so i'm just trying to lead people to a better understanding of themselves but through their own work i'm kind of trying to facilitate change i can't take responsibility for any positive change because it's always on them um i can't pull wisdom out of people that isn't in there i might be able to shine some kind of light on it or maybe probe with an interesting question perhaps but that's how it works. I, it's a monthly service, monthly payments, and then generally weekly or bi-weekly calls, depending. 
I also offer once-off calls, like just once-off deep dive calls, which some clients take me up on when they don't want to commit to full-time coaching. And um, yeah, I'm just lo- I I love it, man. I just love helping people become more strategic, more observant of their own thought patterns. I love the idea of helping people become a little bit more calm. I also really enjoy reminding people that like the insecurities that you're feeling, they don't make you defective; they make you alive. So if you think you're going to diet your way from insecurity, the deficit of calories won't diet you out of that deficit of love. So just keep that in mind too. I mean, that doesn't always land, but sometimes it can be reassuring for people to know that they're not some kind of freak because they don't just love their body and find nutrition easy. So it's complicated, man. But that's, again, it's the kind of thing I could talk about all day long and feel like I've said nothing in a way, but I love it. I can tell. (laughs) Paul, well, we're coming up on an hour here. Um, So I think all all that advice, all your words of wisdom, there were just so many lines in there that I want to expand on. But we just, as you said, we just don't have time for it. But it's, you just have so many of these one-liners that have so much insight into them that even just unpacking them could take another episode. Um, you know, but I, yeah, here we are, Paul. Is, yeah, I, re- I really appreciate that, man. And <clears throat> it's very kind of you to say that. I suppose... One of the things that has helped me, just in case it does help anybody else, is I've held opinions in the past. When I was younger, I was a sarcastic trainer, as in my content was quite sarcastic. And all of us, because my girlfriend jokes, you know, that that's just who I am. And I've tried to put more flavors of my personality on Instagram really recently. But misplaced and wayward sarcasm can look a lot like a lack of compassion. So I think not being afraid to upgrade your thought process and upgrade your belief system in pursuit of more wisdom is a really important thing. So I've been wrong about so many things in the past. I've definitely used inflammatory language that I'm now not proud of. Uh, One of my clients actually made me aware of something I said once. And whilst I didn't agree with her initially, I did have to think, she's my demographic of clients. Like if I I felt really strongly about this, I'd stay firm, but she, she might have a point here. And so I listen to her and I'll always be willing to upgrade my stance if someone can provide me with a useful insight. But also one other thing, man. Sorry, one other thing. I used language before on a particular post and my sister, who I love to bits, one of my best friends, told me that I should change the wording. And I did against my better judgment. And then I got called out on the post. So I remember getting called out thinking, I'm getting called out on something that I don't fully mean. This is a watered down version of me. I should have stayed true. At least when you get challenged on something you truly believe, it's a little bit easier. Um, and, and I guess what I'm going back, it all ties back. If you continue to have a growth mindset and you're willing to evolve your perspective in line with new information, um, I think if I was walking around in a body that had 100 pounds of adiposity on top of me, I'd probably see it very different too. I'd probably relate to it a very different way. And I'd probably relate to personal trainers a very different way. And one client told me that I wasn't this jumped up motivational speech testicle with a protein shake that he feared me to be when he came to the gym that I was just a normal dude with a grey jumper with a with a bottle of Diet Coke and that was such a cool feeling to hear that man I remember thinking ooh I'm onto something I think these are my demographic of people so you know there's an element of there's an element of like present as you wish to be seen but there's also an element of cop the hell on and be a nice person to people as well make everybody feel welcome be, be the reason people stay in fitness be the reason people continue be the reason someone fosters a good relationship to their eating like there was dudes down at the workout park the other day doing muscle ups and you know even I look at them and I'm like half intimidated by them and then there's a dude on the other side of the park struggling to get his first chin up and they go over and help him and I wish everybody finds that kind of thing that instead of feeling ashamed of what they can do or what they can't do that the most jacked girl or guy at the gym comes over and is like come on you get your first rep you know it's a nice feeling to have and I think we all have the power to be that for somebody else definitely Paul thank you for all that advice and I hope the listeners take uh think about it seriously um everything that Paul said today whether it was about fitness travel you can see that it all connects I think this holistic approach to life is very important especially with my goal here at Without Borders My goal is always to break down the borders between peoples, between cultures, so that we can help each other. And I think Paul shed a lot of wisdom on that today. So, Paul, thanks again for coming on the show. And listeners, please support the show by sharing. Check out my Substack. That's bornwithoutborders.substack.com. You can also find my writing there. There's a new episode every Tuesday.